Hello, everybody. My name is Tim Leake. I'm the founder of Alamo Drafthouse Cinema, and I'm here to guide us on a conversation about the new documentary, the, the ultimate social distancing documentary, uh, Spaceship Earth. So we have several guests with us this afternoon. We've got the director, Matt Wolf, and uh, two biospherians, Linda Lay and Mark Nelson, who are joining us for a conversation. And if before we get into that, just want to let you know that we're going to be taking questions from everybody. And if you want to ask a question, just put it into the comments at the YouTube window at the bottom of your window. And we'll take some of those and it'll be fu uh, funneled into me and we'll ask those later on in the conversation. I'll get a few things started in the beginning. And then uh, also, if you liked the film and the experience, please do check into neonrated.com. And uh, that'll tell you all the various ways that we're going to be screening this film. Uh, both virtually and in the physical world. So without any further ado, how about we bring on Matt, Linda, and Mark. How's it going? It's going real well. Hi, Matt. And I think we're still waiting on Linda and Mark. We'll see how this uh, technically goes, but uh, maybe I'll start off with just a couple questions for you. Um, so uh, a, a very, very basic one, uh, which you've probably answered a bunch of times, but I know my own relationship to Biosphere. I, I grew up with this as a child of the 80s and 90s, and I had my lens and perspective on what it was. Uh, but what brought you to the project and what was your understanding of Biosphere before you started on this grand adventure? Well, I was nine years old when the mission started, and I have... I had zero recollection of it. So I was doing research online and I came across these striking images of eight people in, in bright red jumpsuits um, standing in front of a glowing glass pyramid. And uh, I honestly thought they were stills from a science fiction film, but it, it didn't take me long to realize that um, this was a real project and that pyramid is, is still around and that um, the people who had participated in this experiment are still here and doing interesting projects and work. So um, as I learned more, I was really determined to tell their story. Um, and when I um, went to Synergia Ranch, a place that is part of the film for those who have seen it, um, I was brought with my producer, Stacy Reese, into this temperature controlled closet that had hundreds of 16 millimeter film canisters and analog videotapes and thousands of images. Um, and it was really astonishing to me that the group who had conceived of Biosphere 2 had been documenting and archiving everything about their work for, for really half a century. And it felt like just an enormous opportunity and also a big responsibility to tell their story because um, for so long, Biosphere 2 had been regarded as this kind of failure and, and had faded from collective memory. And 25 years had passed from its initial mission and I felt that there was something really meaningful and significant about what they did that resonates today. And I was really interested in reappraising that story. Fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the ranch and I, I'm gonna segue over to, to Mark because there's a moment in the film uh, where they leave the ranch and I was like, oh no, no, that they've, they've, and I was, I was worried that it was gonna just turn to seed and this wonderful facility would, would be no more. And something that I, I, I have some questions about um, you know, as the community, you know, leaves Synergy of Rants and uh, starts working on the ship and has various other ventures, uh, like what is the, what's the scale of the community at large? And did people, even at that time, the initial, um, when it, the Heraclitus be, uh, became the, the focus project, how many people stay behind to maintain the, the network of projects? And I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, Mark answer that. And I, I should also mention uh, that if you want to learn more about this, Mark uh, has uh, written a new book about the biosphere and his experiences called Life Under Glass. Oh, look at that. He's showing it right there on the video window. Awesome. Perfect. Visual aid. So and make sure you get the second edition because the first one was written while we were still inside. So this one has, you know, look backs on it, what all the crew have done in the years past, the years since and research highlights. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, and the film doesn't quite um, lay out. So we had theater of all possibilities. We were an engine for small businesses, but we also started a small institute at Synergia Ranch called the Institute of Ecotechnics. And we wanted to bring the, those two worlds together. So with that background, my shortest description of Bias for Two it was the one of the ultimate ecotechnic challenges and 
test beds and experiments. So in the early years, we had 30 to 35 people at Sinergia Ranch. And it was kind of, since we had a, a worldwide vision from the beginning, we wanted to start projects that were really challenging in difficult environments. The ship was the number two project. In fact, a friend of mine who was watching the film with me, it looked up in horror and said, who was back at the ranch to keep it going? So we kept, uh, you know, we kept five or 10 people at the ranch to keep, uh, you know, making the ranch more beautiful, build more buildings, et cetera. And, and then in later years, we kind of, my toast, we divided and started a project in the Australian outback in Puerto Rico on sustainable rainforest work in the south of France uh, at an art gallery. We, we totally believe that art and science should never be segregated. That's the worst kind of apartheid. Uh, so in, you know, in years past, we sort of looked back at Synergy Ranch as it was kind of our training facility. And virtually everyone who went out, the famous synergists, to start other projects kind of understood and learned how you know, we were approaching things at Synergy Ranch. And so that's actually where I'm speaking to you uh, today, it's an ongoing organic farm and orchard, a small publishing house, Synergetic Press is here, and it's still a, what do we call it, a center for innovation and wellness, and we're 20 miles south of Santa Fe. Fantastic. And uh, uh, if somebody wants to come and visit the ranch, is it open to the public, or is, that, is it a quiet cloistered space? Well, you know, aside from the pandemic shutting down. Yeah, aside from that. Yeah. <laughs> there's a really good website, uh, SynergiaRanch.com. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we host <clears throat> lots of workshops and, and conferences, everything from Jungian psychologists to yoga retreats, Native American shamanic practices. And, and the resident uh, crew, we're about 12 people here in our germ pod during the pandemic, we, we planted our organic uh, farm and are taking care of the orchard and, and doing, anyway, so the, the website will show that. But you know, we're not like uh, Bias for Two. We don't have a visitor's program. And you know, uh, for five hours a day, I'm you know, busy in the farm. So we do appreciate people checking in advance. Well, uh, I'm going to go to uh, to Linda, and um, in in watching the film, I you know uh, was particularly daunted by your your biblical task of um, uh, uh, conceiving of this uh, botanical universe within biosphere. Can you talk a little bit uh, about those those challenges and your headspace at the time when you were uh, given this? mighty Herculean task. Oh, it was such a beautiful task. And <laughs> it was shared by maybe a hundred or a couple hundred consultants. So I did not do that in a vacuum. There are a lot of people working on how to put a world together piece by piece, which is a very different way of thinking. Usually on earth, what we're doing is we're taking them apart. We're killing all the wolves, we're killing all the this, we're pulling this apart here and there. But now we have the opportunity to put things together piece by piece. What do we really need in a biosphere? If we have a closed system, we need plants, of course, to produce oxygen and consume the CO2. But how many of each species did we need? How many individuals to keep the system going for a hundred years, because that was the task. Mm. We were going to close the door for a hundred years. So we had to have all the genetic material, the plants and animals and soils that we thought we would need to have a system for a hundred years. So that just kind of sets some of the boundaries. Another boundary of course, was the size of the biosphere. So trees couldn't be much larger than, than the roof of the biosphere. Um, we had to select our animals also based on a hundred years. How many of each, how many galagos, the small primate do we need to put in to maintain a population for a hundred years? So that's where we brought in lots of consultants, lots of people who know their own individual piece of the earth. And then we put those pieces together. So it was, um, to me, it was equally as exciting to live inside, to start working with these myriad people 
putting together the idea of how do you build an ecosystem. And um, something, you know, as I'm as I'm here, uh, six weeks into my own personal cloistering at home, and I, I look at, uh, but maybe this is something that both you and Mark can talk about, is um, I, I flash forward uh, that maybe this is a much longer time of isolation than we're thinking, like maybe America doesn't get back open next week. Um, and so can you impart any wisdom to me and to the rest of the audience about, let's say this does go on for a year, two years, like how did, how did that affect you guys? And what advice, um, how did it change you? And what advice do you have for us? I think that one of the things that we should all be doing is thinking about what our world will be like in a hundred years. Do we want to have cleaner air, which we do now with quarantine and with, with everything that's happening? Do we want to maintain that? And if we each as individuals want to maintain that, what can we do once the quarantine is lifted, whenever that may be? Um, what can we do to make a difference ourselves towards that and within our community on the much larger scale? So I think that as you're sitting at home or wherever you're, you're sitting, um, waiting to be able to be out with all your pals again, um, think about your, your own personal plan and about the plan that your community has for how we're really going to open up, meaning how are we really going to improve the earth once we're back a part of it? And Mark, you want to weigh in on that subject? We, when we, when um, we uh, acquired this film in Sundance, the, the idea that we'd be entering into this level of cloistered stage was not really part of the equation, but it does seem like now you guys are the experts in social <laughs> isolation. Well, we survived. I mean, I have to say, when I think of my seven crewmates, and we did have a, a wonderful reunion a couple of years ago, I think it was pretty much exactly on the 25th anniversary of coming out. But it was hard. I mean, it was hard, partly because, as the, the film really shows, we had no idea that we were going to be, you know, the focus of so much media attention. So, you know, we had to deal with those pressures. First, we were the heroes of the universe. Then we were charlatans, a cult, <laughs> doing weird science. And can you do science and, and have visitors come there? So we had innumerable pressures on us. And I think the, the really wonderful story was that everyone had commitment to seeing this project through, to doing as much research as possible, but we had difficult uh, days and months. Uh, don't be calorie restricted. Uh, that was not a choice that we had. We just couldn't <laughs> grow more food. We got to be brilliant uh, you know, farmers. And, and we had a two-year meditation on sunfall and trying to get a green plant everywhere that there was sunshine in Biosphere 2. And definitely feast. Feast and, you know, indulge your vices. I mean, <laughs> we, brew, we brewed uh, virtually everything that we could turn into alcohol, we did. And when there was a feast or a, a special morning with coffee beans from Linda's, you know, treasured uh, dwarf coffee trees, that lifted morale amazingly, amazingly. And also try to remember that your loved ones are your loved ones, even when they're being ratty and you're being nasty to them. <laughs> Was there anything from that period um, that you had so much of that to this day you cannot tolerate or uh, would, are you still active beet eaters even today? <laughs> I eat lots of beets. I love beets. Okay. <laughs> but the one thing that I had so much of that was not so good was uh, sweet potato greens. And Roy, Roy made what was clearly one of the worst dishes inside of the biosphere. I'm afraid he's no longer with us to, to um, defend himself, but it was sweet potato greens just put in the blender and he called it soup. Ugh, and um, <laughs> I don't think I'll ever do that again, even though they're very nutritious. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, I had enough of that. <laughs> but I love beets. I love all the things that we had a lot of, including papaya and bananas and um, sweet potatoes. In fact, I'm planting sweet potatoes this week here in Arizona. Nice. Yeah, beets, beets is one of our most successful crops here at, at Synergia Ranch. I, I'm just remembering, Linda, I think that's as close as I ever got to violence. I was the <laughs> envirator person <laughs> setting up and 
doing the dishes for the cook. And it was not only a spectacularly bad soup, but he was trying to perfect a cold green soup. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of just came up and hissed at Roy that if he ever served us anything like that again, there would be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> trouble in the biosphere. Um, I got to go back to, to Matt for a question, and I'm probably going to open it up to some uh, questions from the audience, which is starting to come in. Um, so uh, there's a, what's interesting also about this is uh, in into the, the third act, we get to, um, you know, see Bannon, which is a, you know, if you don't know the story, it's, 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 it's a name you're not expecting to come across in this documentary. And, and then there's the, the, the Ed Bass character, which is such a man of mystery. Um, uh, and so I'd like to know, um, one, have you heard from Steve Bannon or Ed Bass after the doc and how they feel? I know that you know, uh, Ed is, from the note, continued to contribute uh, to uh, Biosphere to make sure that it does sustain. And it's such a, it's a I'm sure, a very complex relationship uh, with him, uh, with the, the biospherians, but I'm curious if they have reached out to you and, uh, have any feelings about the film or if you have any, uh, anecdotes about reaching out to them directly to be involved in the film. Yeah. I mean, I actually didn't reach out to them and we haven't heard from them. I think <laughs> my point of view, my point of view, um, from Ed is that he was this kind of benevolent backstage figure who mm -hmm. um, had this very unusual kind of risk adverse um, attitude about investing in the long run to, to invest that level of money into a project that was designed to exist for a hundred years is pretty unusual. And mm -hmm. um, he really leaped in and believed in the vision of this project. Of course, he, he was under mounting pressure um, as the media was attacking the project and questioning its credibility. And that's when he did hire Steve Bannon, who was a Goldman Sachs investor at the time. And, and Steve Bannon did take over. And so um, I feel like Steve Bannon has the microphone too much. It wasn't necessarily my <laughs> prerogative to give it to him more. Um, and I didn't want that kind of contemporary political scoop to, to kind of overwhelm the story, which to me is much bigger than that. But I was always really interested in Biosphere 2 as a metaphor, um, a, a reimagined world, quite literally, that, that eight people were responsible to, to manage and to be stewards of um, as a microcosm for our own kind of position in the world and how we might shift our perspective and, and impact. And so the takeover of Biosphere 2 by Steve Bannon is in some ways similar to the takeover of Biosphere 1, which these guys use to refer to as planet Earth. Um, you know, the, the political and economic forces that play that continue to precipitate fossil fuel extraction and to limit any kind of policy um, or international treaties that can protect us from catastrophic climate change is, um, is insidious. It's a, it's a horrible takeover of our planet. So um, like so many things in this film, um, that incident and that strange, bizarre political um, connection to today really brings into focus the, the stakes we have um, for the future. And, and to me, Biosphere 2 was always very much envisioning the future. Well, I, I, I should thank you for, for not giving Steve Bannon the, the microphone for your project. I think you hit the nail just perfectly. It's, it's, uh, but it was, a, it was a wonderful moment of where the, where the hell is this going in, the, in terms of the documentary narrative. Um, Mark, do you have any insight into uh, 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 the, the initial uh, relationship between Ed and, and John and how he came into the picture and became this uh, benevolent Yeah, well, you investor? know, I Ed, Ed uh, obviously, if you do any uh, Wikipedia search, is from a, a pretty wealthy and mainly from oil uh, mm -hmm. group of brothers, four brothers, the Bass brothers. And he was always the maverick. Uh, he went to Yale, studied architecture, traded Navajo rugs. So we <laughs> ran into him in New Mexico in about 1974. We, we helped him finish a <clears throat> building that he had designed and he lived at Sinergia Ranch. He was a director of the Institute of Ecotechnics for about 20 years until, until the you know, paths diverged under the huge pressure of Biosphere 2. His family always were very low profile. And I think they were okay when we were lionized by the press, 
when, when it all became kind of sensationalized and, and condemned that I'm sure put a lot of pressure on Ed, but he's a very visionary guy. He started a foundation called Phil Ecology. You know, philanthropy is love of people. He was saying, we also need to love ecology. So he, he was a very visionary guy. Yeah, we wanted Bias for Two to remake the investment, but Ed had always, you know, kept his capitalist Goldman Sachs type advisors at bay by saying 95% of my uh, funds are invested in your typical capitalist way. I reserve 5% of my wealth to invest in visionary and ecologically, you know, beneficial projects. Well, I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it up because uh, I know we've got a, it's a bunch of people out there wanting to ask questions. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and drop the first one, which is, what did the Biospherians do in your downtime? And did you ever take a day off? <laughs> <laughs> By that you know, laugh, I assume no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, farmers don't have days off. Yeah. And so, on. Uh, no, the answer is no, we never had days off. We might have a few hours off here and there. We always had to have our walkie talkies and, and we didn't have cell phones then. We had our walkie talkies on all the time in case we, there was an emergency or we needed to attend to something that we didn't know about previously. But um, no, no days off. Um, Saturdays, I would take care of the goats and relieve somebody else from doing that. Sundays, no, Saturdays, we would all clean up our common spaces. And Sundays, I would, you know, take over some other activities that I normally wouldn't do during the week. Um, but things that I like to do is, is I really liked to write. I did a lot of journal writing and I did a lot of communications with people at something called the Whole Earth Electronic Link, the well. We didn't have really fast social um, media at that time. So it was very clumsy to be able to talk back and forth. But I did really maintain, a, to me, a valuable dialogue with people on the outside during the, quote, downtime, which was never really down. Mm -hmm. Well, we were never totally down. But, I, well, another disagreement, Linda. We tried to <laughs> make our weekends weekends. So there were no formal crew meetings on Sundays, but it's true, you know, we did the cooking and helping the cook in rotation. So once every eight days, you were the cook for three meals, et cetera. And obviously domestic animals have to be fed. I, I had a, a job which makes me very uh, sympathetic when I go around the world to subsistence farmers who are carrying a lot of feed for their animals on their backs. I was the fodder collector and our animals, I believe, ate something like 70 pounds of inedible crop mass every day. But I'd work like hell on Friday to get a supply for the weekend in there. And, you know, we, we also, we relished having parties and feasts, birthdays, any holiday, we realized if we worked and people on the outside in mission control were taking the day off, that's just maddening. And there's some months that we didn't have a birthday. And I, I actually love that picture of you, Linda, with your wreath of peanut greens. And I think one <laughs> August, I think August didn't have a birthday or a holiday. It was peanut harvest uh, celebration and we made a feast day of it. So we, we tried to do that. And I think all the crew loved going around the biosphere and just watching our biomes grow up. Mm. You know, I, I liken it that we had a bonsai biosphere and we didn't know how to be biospherians. We were all learning and growing up together. That's great. Um, so there's another question um, uh, talking about the second mission um, and uh, uh, your involvement with the second mission, but then also, um, if, if that's not uh, something that it's gonna yield a, a great answer, I'd, I'd really love to know your relationship with Biosphere now. I mean, Linda in particular, I know you live very close and then Mark, whether you have visited and what it, what it means to you as like a physical entity at, at this point in your life. 
Um, I get called upon to give talks at the biosphere, mm -hmm. um, always about the history of uh, building and living inside the biosphere to classes, college classes, little kids, all different ages. Um, they have people who classes who come and stay for a couple days at a time. And so I get to go in and tell them about what it was like to live inside. I absolutely love doing that. Um, I'm welcome to go inside the biosphere anytime I want to do so. And I take friends through it whenever I have friends visiting or their friends of friends visiting and take a look at it. It's, it's very, very different than it was when we lived inside, of course, um, because people don't have to rely on the plants for their oxygen. They have the whole world. It's not a closed system. Mm -hmm. So they don't need to take care of the plants the way we did. But um, I, I still love Biosphere 2 very much. I'm not doing any research there. Um, I try to keep abreast of what they are doing. Yeah, when I go back to Biosphere 2, I, I'm still very, very emotionally connected to it. There was a very terrible period. Uh, some of the take over politics that the film touches on. I mean, I was one of the ousted owner managers. I was one of the dirty dozen, uh, as we, <laughs> we dubbed ourselves. And things were really tense. I mean, for a few years, there were only photographs of the second crew and none of the first crew. And the only thing they said about the first closure was a litany of all of the things, the problems and challenges we had. Uh, so I'm very appreciative now that the University of Arizona both manages and owns the facility. They've been much more generous and acknowledging, you know, we had world class scientists, you know, the teams that uh, Linda was talking about. It couldn't have been pulled off without really top level institutions, ecologists and engineers. But I don't, you know, I am beginning to get some emotional distance just like I did on my third viewing of Spaceship Earth. Now I can really appreciate it as a marvel instead of, you know, oh my God, what unknown footage of me and my pals am I gonna see next? <laughs> it's an amazing <laughs> film. And I, I you know, I, I, am, uh, I am deeply appreciative that the University of Arizona continues to do research in there. I'm sad that they got rid of the farm that was Columbia University but that it's an amazing, it just knocks your socks off to go, the architecture that we built is just astounding. I mean, people go there a little bit like, I don't mean to be megalomaniac, but the feeling I get watching people go around Biosphere, and this started when we were inside, is they're going to play homage to, you know, a piece of amazing human nature creation like they do to the, the pyramids or the Taj Mahal. It kind of has that emotional impact. I mean, that's, um, it's interesting you say that because I think that's the, that was the biggest emotional impact that the documentary had for me. You know, one was just an understanding of something I only had a vague sense of, but then this, almost this inspirational idea of look at the amazing things that uh, people that have a rudder in the water can put their heads together and do something truly extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's a, to me, I look upon the story, what I, I take away from it, at least personally, is, is an inspirational story of that. So, I mean, thank you guys <laughs> for, for doing something beyond human. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful. So and that's not, a, I yell at people sometimes for saying things in Q and A's that aren't questions. It's not a question. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on to a question. <laughs> um, so uh, <clears throat> inside the biosphere, a uh, small group of people, it's a relatively abstract um, in terms of what the day-to-day -day duties are uh, when you're setting up. Um, now that you're into the biosphere for six months, look around, who had the sweetest gig inside biosphere? And do you wish that your roles and responsibilities would have been different uh, had, you, had you known what it was going to be like? Whoa. <laughs> we all had different uh, responsibilities which I think really gave coherence. We were organized with a day-to-day uh, -day, uh, captain and an emergency captain if, you know, if, we, if something really terrible happened. But each person, like Linda, you know, she was the matriarch of the terrestrial wilderness uh, biomes. I was the communications officer. I was kind of an assistant to Linda on doing research in those biomes. I was the chief fodder man. 
I was in charge of the sewage treatment system. <laughs> it sounds really nasty. And, and it, I've written a book because it launched 20 years of, can we say this on, online? We're actually talking about it. I'm uh, an expert in constructed wetlands to sh recycle shit in a productive, beautiful way. So yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really feel the jealousy. I learned to scoop it, uh, to snorkel on our beautiful coral reef there. And I, I'm glad that I wasn't in charge of going down and doing research because I probably would have damaged the uh, corals in my clumsiness. <laughs> so I, I don't know, it's a very diverse thing. And actually, of course, here's a book plug. When we were writing the first edition of Life Under Glass, we picked one day. And so one of these chapters is a day in the life, a little homage to the Beatles. But I wanted to chronicle you know, through the working day, how many different things the Biospherians did. We were scientists, we were farmers, we were technicians, we were cooks and chefs. And, you know, I think that was one of the wonderful things about being a Biospherian is we were in charge of an entire world and we were all cross-trained. We didn't know, but hardly anyone got sick after the closure, that if someone got sick, that you'd be someone else that they could do their job. And I'll stop there. Um, I would say that I had the sweetest job. <laughs> I, really, I really loved the wilderness area. You know, it, I helped to build it. I got to work with all these remarkable people to put it together. And now I was inside to watch it grow, to watch it mature and to help it work, work. Uh, you don't need to help nature work. But uh, in a sense, that's that's what I was feeling about it. So I loved my job very much, and I, I really didn't feel any jealousy either towards anybody else's work. Great. Um, you mentioned uh, in, in the film it speaks about uh, a two-year mission, but you mentioned a hundred-year mission. Um, and uh, if there were a way to kind of replay history, would either of you have preferred to be on an extended, say, 10, 20, 100 year mission? Uh, probably not possible to do the 100 year mission, but you know what I mean, to have to, to be in biosphere for a long time, as opposed to the way that things worked out. Yes. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> yeah. A number of us secretly communicated with mission control that if they needed somebody else to go in on the second closure, that we were ready to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, leaving bias for two, sure, we missed a lot of things and loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I was aware as I was leaving bias for two that I will never live in as beautiful and diverse and consciously thought out and beautifully executed world where everything makes sense. You know, even if you live, and I, I love that my life as an organic farmer, but if you're out here, you're dealing with banks and credit cards and, and forms and bureaucracy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Inside Biosphere 2, there was no money. And almost everything that you did had an impact. So it was important. There was no small anonymous actions. And it made sense. Fabulous. But I'm glad you, you bring this up and, and maybe Linda could speak to that too because people really misunderstand the scientific, uh, serious scientific import of bias for two. Over to you, Linda. Yeah, the importance of that 100 years can't be underestimated. We really, really wanted to be able to study the biosphere for 100 years. Um, in the film, I'm talking to Phil Donahue and I say, yeah, we're gonna close the door for a hundred years. We're not gonna let anything in or anything out. Well, that was my naivete. I couldn't have known that. We hadn't closed the door. We hadn't made the measurements to see what we would expect. But um, I would have loved to have been a person who would for 50 years been inside and made improvements and watch how everything grew and how everything essentially self-organized, how this beautiful system self-organized. I'll give you an example of something that I really, one thing that I really loved about being in the biosphere um, and Mark touched on it, which is a sense of responsibility and a sense of not being anonymous. Um, one night, um, the carbon dioxide, every, every day in the morning, we would all get together over breakfast and see what had happened in the 
atmosphere overnight. Mm -hmm. So we looked at our CO2 graphs and our oxygen graphs and other things, and the carbon dioxide had just gone off the charts for no reason that we knew inside the biosphere. So we all dropped our daily activities and we walked around to try and figure out what was going on. A hose had been left on, on a compost pile. We were drying compost so that the microbes wouldn't be consuming oxygen and producing CO2. So we're trying to reduce the oxygen consumption and the CO2 production by drying out the compost, but by making it wet. That immediately made all of the microbes active and boom, we had decomposition happening. So we could see that happening overnight. We could even, if we wanted to, point a finger at who had let that hose on so that make sure that they hadn't done <laughs> it again. I don't think we did that, though. I don't know if any one of us remembered. But here I am with my compost piles outside. Nobody cares if I leave a hose on. Nobody's measuring my carbon dioxide. I can do whatever I want to contribute to our big atmosphere. Now, that really blows me away that I can do that without anybody measuring it. And inside of Biosphere 2, we measured everything. It's a beautiful way to live. So I think being conscious of what happens because of our actions here on Earth to contribute to this huge atmosphere that we all share was a really important part of my understanding from Biosphere 2. So Matt, I'll go, go back to you for a couple of things. First, um, uh, what is the process for you in, in this case of, of gaining the trust of everyone? You know, the, the Biosphere Project uh, was plagued with, you know, unfair portrayal in the media, and we don't even need to talk about Polly Shore and what that does to the legacy of, of uh, the Biosphere Project. Um, it, you know, I would assume there might be some dukes up, a little bit of guarded behavior. So can you describe the process of, you um, uh, ensuring that people know that you can be trusted with this material. And then a question from online. Uh, how do you think you would have fared in the biosphere for two years? Um, I wouldn't have fared well. I'm too lazy. I couldn't <laughs> <work that>. um, <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, it's really interesting to answer that question with two people who trusted me right here in Zoom with me. Um, they, might, they might be able to answer better than me. But for me, I think when I approach somebody, um, I think it's important to do homework, to understand. Uh, and I, as I understand, these guys have been approached many times and many people have tried to tell this story, make this film over the years. And I try to do my homework and to come to people with knowledge of what their story is and the work they've done um, and to understand what's been said about it in the past and to try to make a new contribution to that story, but also to be open to hearing their point of view. I think something I've realized over the years is there is no definitive story of any kind of person's life or project. And it's it's always up for interpretation. And, and for a story as complex as Biosphere 2, I, I needed to, to take a tact or an angle to it. I couldn't just relay the Byzantine plot and all of its details and information and to make something engaging and entertaining for everybody. So um, a lot of it is just listening and hearing people's stories and, and gaining their perspectives, but also to come to them in an informed way, not just in a kind of open-minded, curious sense. Fantastic. And um, we're reaching the, the end of our, our time together, but I wanted to I would, I could close out and Matt, I won't ask you this because uh, uh, I, I don't think it's appropriate for filmmakers to ask what your next project is. You want to keep that maybe under wraps. Uh, but um, for uh, Linda and Mark, um, maybe just talk about uh, what you're working on, what gives you joy and excitement and what you're looking forward to in the future. And Matt, you can answer that too if you want to, but I'm giving you the <laughs> out. <laughs> they're, they're more interesting. <laughs> Um, I love work. What gives me joy, that's a good way to put it, is working with our community. We just started the Oracle Community Learning Garden here in our small town of about 4,000 people. And what I love is the community has come forward and owned it. People go there and they do things on their own. I don't have to be a person who tells people what to do. After about a year and a half, the community owns this garden. They're planting things, building greenhouses, putting in irrigation systems. And it's such a delight to watch this community together and watch the team mature, really. It's the maturation of a team, which is beautiful. Um, I'm also working on um, food security issues in our 
community and our region. And um, it, it breaks my heart that people are hungry, that people are hungry nearby. So in terms of food, we can grow a victory garden at our community garden, but we're also figuring out ways to bring food in so that people don't have to be hungry. So those are my passions right now. Right. It is interesting to uh, to see with the, the food supply, what's happening now that the uh, where the, the real pressure where things are falling apart is in the, the large scale farm and meat processing facilities, but yet local farms are thriving like never before. It does sort of make you wonder like what the best process is, but we don't have mm -hmm. to get into that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mark, what, uh, what's bringing you joy? What are you excited about? Well, you know, echoing what you were saying, uh, and I hope people, you know, read more about Bias for Two because that farm that we had was beyond organic and it had to be because otherwise we would have poisoned ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I love being part of the farming community at a local level here in, <clears throat> in Santa Fe in Northern New Mexico. Farmers markets were declared an essential business because we're, you know, we're pretty shuttered down like much, much of the country. And I, I uh, totally it's still enamored with the small Institute of Ecotechnics and putting into play new approaches. You know, we have to steward ourselves. We have to redesign our technosphere. We have challenges. The Heraclitus is being rebuilt in Catalonia. So if people got turned on by that amazing uh, historic footage of it launching. It has traveled 270,000 miles, more than a one-way ticket from here to the moon. And we're rebuilding it for another 40 years of adventure. We have a glorious project that I love going to and being hands-on in Puerto Rico, but it got hit by Hurricane Maria. We planted 40,000 trees to demonstrate sustainable forestry. We're rebuilding that project. So, and I, you know, I was looking at the film and I, I understand why Matt just wanted to have the old guard who, you know, who figure in the film. But the really exciting thing for me at the ranch, for example, is that there's a new generation here. And I'm, actually, I am not the, the, the main enchilada even in the organic farm. I can step back a little bit and, and mentor a new generation. And I think that's really what, it, what it's all about. And you know, that's what I also love about Biastra 2 re-entering the conversation because I think ultimately it is a really inspirational uh, story and it reached hundreds of millions of people pre-internet, it still has a lot of lessons and legacy to give because we all need to get inspired to do our bit and make, you know, preserve the earth and make the, the earth that we want to live with. One thing I'll say too is Neon is releasing this film in an interesting way where you can see it and support a variety of small businesses and independent theaters, but that both the projects that Linda and Mark are doing are participating in that. So if you're interested in seeing the film and supporting their work, um, you can rent the film from the Oracle Community Learning Garden or from um, the Institute of Ecotechnics uh, or Synergetic Press, the, the publishing house outside of the ranch too. So um, there are interesting ways to support the, the work these guys are doing as well, and as well as other small businesses or groups that are in your community. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for the plug. <laughs> well, guys, I've really enjoyed the conversation, and I can tell you this one data point, I, I am inspired uh, and moved by what you guys have been able to accomplish in your lives. And um, so thank you for all that you have done. Thank you, Matt, for making a wonderful film. And uh, thank you to the folks out there listening. Uh, please share the word. If this is uh, the film of the official, I think uh, the president might have declared it to be the official film of the coronavirus uh, period. No, I don't know. Probably not. Anyway, we don't. Uh, we don't want. We don't want his endorsement. We'll take somebody else's. Sorry, endorsement. I was going. To, I was doing so well, and then I just brought up his name. Just strike that from the record. We'll fix it in post. All right, uh, guys. Uh, it's a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you hopefully soon. Bye, -bye. thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.